Podcast, episode 65, Big Borg Cliffhanger, on Thursday, April 8th, 2021. And now, nobody will understand. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk65. Hey, guess hey. what? We, we made it to March again. Uh, are you sure about that? Uh, and you know we we flew by it. When was the last pod? When was Podkit sixty four? We're a bit we're a bit late these this year, I think. February eighth. Okay, yeah, that was that was that was a bit ago, but you know we're back. I mean, that, to me, that's really recent. It, I mean, yeah, we 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 have been doing pretty good about monthly with Podkit, but all I can say is we did three months in a row in twenty twenty. We did October, November, and December. That's an achievement right there. That is. And now we're doing every other month. And so I think this is quite impressive. Yeah. Our cadence is like one to two months, depending on how we're feeling. <laughs> anyway, glad we're all back. Uh, the big topics here we have, it uh, looks like two or three. The fir- first one I'll briefly touch on is uh, I have a new job. I will be starting it in a few days here. So I have a week of fun employment right now. I've just been... Uh, Watching Star Trek Next Generation, building the Lego Space Shuttle set that was released, uh, came in the mail this week, so it was released about a week ago. Yeah, I don't know, it's hanging out. Excellent. I have to ask, have you got to Darmok yet in Star Trek? I don't think so. Okay. I, I literally finished season three, episode 25 this afternoon, which is the one right before the big Borg uh, cliffhanger one into season four. Uh-oh. So that's that's what's next for me. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it. Season five, episode two, Darmok. Darmok Jel- and Jalad at Tanagra. Keep an eye out for that one. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. You were messaging me about that. I'm going to keep I'm gonna keep reminding you that that episode is a very good episode until you get there. And you're going to be like, I have no idea. I, I've even seen TNG and I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I'll just say Temba, his arms wide. Yeah, there you go. Nobody will understand. And that's that's nope. that's the thing. So that's okay. Well, to give any context to where I just finished, Wesley Crusher just got promoted to actual ensign instead of acting ensign. So now he has a uniform. So that's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, to like uh, tech things. Yeah, I have a new job. I'd been at C. Robinson for nearly four and a half years full time and an intern before that. So I had a great experience there. Um, no hard feelings with anyone. It was a really difficult decision. Uh, March was... Uh, pretty anxious of a month but yeah i just think it's a good time to try something new and more to come on that in the future that's great to hear yeah definitely excited for you dude so is that going to be a lot of front-end stuff or what it, what, it, what kind of work are you going to do yeah i'll be a senior front-end engineer on their front-end team so presumably lots of front-end stuff you would hope so yeah i think there'll be a little more variety of products that i work on it'll be interesting i've only worked at Z robinson and pretty much with the same team the whole time so it'll be Really interesting to like get thrown into a new project and things because I've never really worked through that. So I think it'll be a challenging time, but that's kind of why I wanted to to make a, ch- a change here. So get some new experience, mix it up. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely excited for you. It sounds like it's going to be a, r- a really cool thing. And, you know, as somebody who also spent most of their the start from the start of their career onto mid career at, at one place, you know, that kind of move to the first new thing is is really exciting and i think uh really hyped to to see what you do at the new place sure sure hope it's the right move (laughs) it's yeah i've i've really liked my team and everyone i've worked with there so it's it's been a tough tough choice to make it's really the only time i've ever like put in my notice to leave a job everything else has been seasonal or part-time around school or or some other external force and so so when uh monday comes i also heard you got a standing desk matt I did get a standing desk, Matt. Uh, one that uh, you have, actually, Brandon. That's and true. you were mostly talking about it as a place for a dog to sit on. Yes. And uh, I just kind of, you know, I don't I don't have a dog. I don't ever plan on having a dog, but um, <laughs> I, I want to stand on it. And your slight uh, avoidance of talking about actually standing on it, um, <laughs> I, still, I still went around and bought it anyway, so... It's quite nice. I'm using it now. I'm standing on mine right now too, because it is actually a really great standing desk mat. And um, it encourages me to use my 
desk in standing desk mode because it's so comfortable. And I think you commented occasionally, I don't know, it might've been when we were running a meetup or something about how much I move around when I'm on the standing desk mat. And I think that's definitely something that is really special about this one. And why I like it a lot is because there are lots of like places for you to put your feet. So you can always find a place that feels comfortable, whether you want to move around or not really. Um, it's also really great for dogs because dogs <laughs> like sitting and it and if your dog is of an appropriate shape and size that they can kind of curl up in the middle that's really cute so you know just just put that out there you know in case you need that for those of you who have dogs and like those dogs to hang out with you when you're working because it's pretty it's pretty adorable yeah i would get one of these i've considered it but i um okay hold up for context let's let's tell the listener what we're talking about so this is a topo comfort mat by ergo driven they have a mini, a smaller one, and a full-size one. Uh, this is the more full-size one. Uh, it's basically like a padded mat, and there's a little bump in the center, like to kind of roll the your your stand on with your feet, just to kind of apply different pressure. There's a little lip on the back and kind of all around the side, so you can kind of putz around and have different positions and things um, to, I don't know, massage your feet, but also just have different positions and mix it up a bit. So, well, I'm just reading the pictures, and it's. The the regular size is good if you're five foot four or taller, and the other the little one is if you're under five foot four. And I just think it's funny that you should get a a less wide mat if you're shorter. Okay, great. Well, your legs aren't as long, and so it's less comfortable to stand with your feet further apart or something. Or something, I think, is the correct answer. So uh, I, I would get one of these kinds of things, but when I am in standing mode, I just leave my computer wherever it is, and I just walk around, and I, I pace on my meetings. Um, I don't I don't know if any listeners would um, do anything like that, but I, I believe there's at least one listener who might. I do a little bit of that, but um, I kind of like that this, this is smaller. Well, it's a little bit wider, but it's a lot... Well, the ratio is different. Anyway, it's more like a square, and my other one is a rectangle, and so this is... That feels a bit smaller, which I think is kind of nice. My other one was large, and I didn't really use the full width of it. So I, don't, I, I like to walk around a little bit, but not super often. I have wires going for headphones or things, so I'm a little bit tethered. Oh, yeah. I I um I use the uh, Jabra headset with the iPad so I can wander. It's great. Yeah. Uh, I have a, another, another topic. So um, actually, in my last week... At, at the old job, um, I went through and did a big create React App 3 to create React App 4 upgrade. Um, there's, this is uh, wrapped in some other tooling there, but um, that would be interesting to talk about because I've, I've done this upgrade on my Secret Santa site, um, but that is such a smaller site that it really didn't have any issues because it was so simple and there weren't really any like weird use cases that kind of fell apart with any of these upgrades. So I thought it would just be interesting to talk about a little bit of that. Um, I know the two of you love to hate on Create React App, probably what? particularly Brandon. What? Me? Hate on Create React App? I use that for everything. Maybe it's just Brandon then. I don't know. I like to use Yeet React App, which is <laughs> a, a script to remove Create React App from any project ever. So is that eject, in other words? No, Yeet. Yeet. Ah. Uh. That means throw it out completely, not even eject it. Yes. Or a DRA, which is defenestrate React app, which means to throw it out the window. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's that's, that's definitely my, my hot take there. Uh, I mean, what is that? The next best thing? Yeah. So I just, um, I should see if those package names are available and then like lose all professional respect from everybody who I know and care about. Um, but, you know, it's... Uh, <sighs> I always I always have mixed feelings about it because obviously it's a it's a really compelling starter kit for a lot of people and it's treated often as the de facto standard. I just disagree with basically every choice it makes, um. <laughs> which I find so fascinating because I I don't find many of the other options even a possible choice. Yeah, yeah, like I don't think there's really any better option than create React app, and I think most of the choices they've made have been with good reason and are as a whole a lot better to have those choices that they have made than to not or you know i remember back in the day so most of my like uh i did some webpack stuff with react but i did a, most of the stuff my webpack days were with angular js and um 
wow, I don't want to go back to that if I don't have to. <laughs> and I don't think it's, you know, I think it's worth some small workarounds with Crate Racked Up than to eject and own all of that yourself. My my counterpoint to that is most of the times that I've, I've, I've almost always had to eject from Create React Up at some point. And it's usually been because of some very, very subtle or complicated webpack thing that was non-negotiable or was already like nudged in there but i've i've uh beat this to death and this is um this is brian's uh this is brian's time to chat so i'll stop i'll keep my uh create react app crappy reasoning adjustments i don't know i was trying to do it it worked acronym (laughs) acronym there uh to myself because i agree with you that you know for the most part it's probably you know there's there's a reason why it's the de facto starter kit it just makes totally different decisions than what i almost always need to make which is why i almost always end up with something different yeah well, um, let's see. Uh, in the upgrade, so we go from Jest 24 to Jest 26. Uh, so two major version updates. I think they're both like fairly small. Uh, one thing was they upgraded the JS DOM environment, which uh, we had already been opting into using the latest version. So that really didn't affect us. We already kind of took that change earlier. It seems like they're either in Create React App or in maybe some configuration internally. Uh, with the other wrapper that we were using. But it looks like it was using just Circus as the test runner and was automatically retrying tests if they failed. And we had been using with the just config for end-to-end tests with that uh, tool, internal tooling library. So I'm curious if that's some of that just configuration is leaking to unit tests. But either way, a lot of the time when the unit tests in the app I was working on would fail would be because of timeouts because um, there's so many tests and they're kind of integration style. And so there's a lot of code running and things that would time out. Mm -hmm. And so retrying actually caused the test to pass a lot more often. And it's just interesting seeing like, oh, there are like three failed tests. And then like, you know, is is this running 900 tests? And then it would start to go down like two failed tests, one failed test. Oh, they're all, they all passed again. So that was kind of cool. I run this enough, it will work better. Yeah, exactly. So that was kind of cool to see. Uh, but because of that, Create React App now configures um, the reset mocks to be true, which is in Jest is defaulted to false, but Create React App is in overriding that. And so it means you need to, if you're mocking, you know, if you're using a Jest.fn mock, you need to set its mock implementation or its mock return or resolve value or whatever you're using every test. So you need to move that into like a before each block. And the biggest part where that was breaking things was we would use the just mock inside of a module mock. So we would do just.mock and then pass in the path to some file that we were mocking that file. And we were making an, an object that that module would return. And then like instead of having it... So sometimes we we're mocking out a component to just like return a div with a test ID so we can just assert that some nested thing was rendered without actually rendering everything. Other times it's like some library code that we just want to like resolve to something or whatever. But using a just mock function inside of that module mock meant that it's being reset every single test. So it either only works in the first test in the test suite, or in many cases, it just wasn't working at all. And we had to switch to just using like a plain vanilla function. And oftentimes the mock was just returning the same thing every time. So we could just switch to, instead of using the just mock function, we just switched to a function that was just hard coding its return value. And so that worked for most of the time. But that was some... Interesting notes. So basically the tests are a lot more pure now. Things like using fake timers now needs to be in a before each block instead of just the top level of your file or something. So little things like that that caused, I think we had 190 tests failing out of 900. Oh, wow. And I would lose my mind. Most of them were failing because of the timer stuff moving to before each and the mock functions being reset. So I think you know, we, we fixed those and then there were maybe like a dozen or two tests that were failing. So that was the vast majority. Can I just note briefly that this was caused by a thing in which you differed from the create React app default config. I just want to register that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? What what am I what are we differing with? Uh, in config? Uh, it was, uh, all those tests are failing because CRA made a change in the just config, right? Yes. There you go. Just wanted but, to put that but, on the record. But <laughs> very convincing argument. We are upgrading CRA. Yes, I mean, well, that's why it's a major, a major breaking change. Yeah. So 
it's, you know, there are enhancements in Jest and things. Like, eventually, we need to upgrade to support newer versions of Node. I think they dropped a few old versions of Node. So there's just, you know, that kind of stuff changes over time because there's just churn and all these dependencies that we use. Yeah. Um, and I think tests were that it's some speed improvements. And I think Jest is working through reducing the amount of dependencies in it. And so there's a lot more consolidation. So, like, there are subtle differences in things. And it's, you know, they are generally in the purpose of improving things. So... I don't know. Good to upgrade, but yes, it's it's uh, breaking things just for the sake of breaking them. At the same time, so when it resets mocks for each test, will it reset like the mocks in the mocks folder? Like, how does that work? Like, will it really do like a? Clean... I don't use those kind of mocks. Okay, I've, I've uh, I tried once on a on my Secret Santa app, but I don't actually might still be using that. I don't remember. Will it reset like the top level mocks, like the the ones globally registered. What do you mean by globally registered? Like you can in your uh, Jest setup, you can register. Like if I see a module import called blah, mock it with this other thing. Okay. Yes, those get reset between tests as well. So those you need to. That's good. I like that. But yeah, so that meant there are a few files where you know we are mocking, and then later on we are requiring them and resolving something different and so that broke some of those tests a little bit so we had to like you know inline a little more of that new before each versus just overriding in a couple cases so you know subtle things you know probably some patterns that weren't the best in the first place that Mm -hmm. we had to kind of clean up and so you know i think these kind of making all of your tests very pure conceptually I i really support and i like it was just a few cases where we weren't holding true to that that we're starting to fail some tests so i think that was a good change uh, let's see. The other thing that we did was upgrade from TypeScript 3.9.9 to 4.2.3. I think that did need a Crit React App update. I think technically we could use 3.9 in Crit React App 3, but there are some dependencies and things in a few places that were like, maybe the latest supported version is actually 3.7 or 3.8. So there are a couple warnings here and there, but moving to version four, there are a few things around like generators with some Redux Saga use that hadn't touched that code in years that need to just you know there i I think basically if you yield a value from a different generator the return type can't be inferred and in prior versions it was just under the hood it typed as any even though we had strict mode on and no implicit any was enabled uh so then that started becoming a type error and so we just had to type the return value like you know const value colon and then give it the type that equals whatever we yield so that was pretty easy to do there are a couple of unit tests that were breaking around where a generator could yield one value or another it could kind of infer that and so when we were kind of like mocking out stuff let's see when you run a generator you pass in the previously yielded value as an argument to run the next loop i don't know it generated anyway we just uh did some ts ignores and went on our way good enough so Yep. I didn't want to deal with that. That's, you know, code that I don't think will ever really be changed. It's kind of the more legacy parts of the application that will just go away at some point in the future. So anyway, um, and then some new ESLint rules. So tied to TypeScript. um, So these are ESLint rules, I think, set in the Create React App stuff. Something I learned is that the type, like open squiggly brace, close squiggly brace, is not an empty interface when used like if you do like extends squiggly brace, squiggly brace, or, you know, if you equal it to, uh, to that, it actually, uh, I think means, I forget the error. It's basically like any object that's not null or something. Like yeah. it's a super wide type. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, it's an object with no properties is kind of how I was using it. And so that threw a bunch of errors around the application. Um, so that was interesting to refactor out. And so the suggested alternative is to use or maybe this is the object keyword, but to use record, and then you pass in the first generic argument is string, and the second is unknown. So it's an object it, you know, under the hood. The record type helper creates an object. The first the first argument in the generic t- type is the key, and the second is the value. So the key is the string, and the value is unknown. So I always think it's funny that it's a string because what else could it be? But that's okay. A number or a symbol. That, well, that's the thing though is I use it for enum types or stuff like that, where I where I want the object to have a to have a specific set of keys potentially. 
when yep. it always yep. will boil down to one of those three things. But I always think it's funny, like string, and it's like, yeah, and. Yeah. Do you ever uh, make some automatic or some automagical types where you use key of and type of like oh, next to each other? All the time. Love that. Key of type of interface or yeah, function or whatever. It's that. like, oh, it's so so mind numbing to read, it, but it it's so magical when you wrap your head around it. You're like, oh, this is great because you don't have to type out all this intermediary stuff. You just like figure it out and it works. Yep. Um, it discourages using the object keyword, but we're using React table and basically everything extends object. So we just disable that ESLint rule because it would have failed a ton of stuff. And like we could override our app code, but then we were getting more type errors because the library code says it has to extend object and then our, the types just didn't match up. So, so that was something we just disabled. Yep. And then also part of the correct up update is because we went to Re- uh, react 17 and with TypeScript 4.1, we can use the new JSX transform. So we removed import React from React from like 500 files. <laughs> and there was a time I was, so I did some like find replace across the whole whole app. So I did, you know, import React from React and delete. And then I did, I think I searched for some import star from React or import star as React from React, which I used some places, but that often broke some other code because things were using React dots. Then it was like going around fixing some, some type errors. But there was one case I'm using regular expressions here to like find replace and I messed up and I deleted a bunch of stuff, but then I was able to recover it by using even more fancy find replace things. And it was, I just felt like a, a regular expression wizard, which is kind of fun. Nice. Regular expression wizard. I like that too. Yeah. I mean, that JSX transform is not, is not terribly new, right? I mean, like next does the same thing. Rec 17. And has for like years. Rec 17 came out maybe six months ago. Huh. Well, like Next has been doing that for like years though. But they had like the Babel transform version of it and it wasn't Yeah, they had uh, the Babel transform. You can yeah, you can configure your Babel or maybe TypeScript config to provide a global. Oh, so sure. you could kind of work around it. But under the hood it was still using the same old transform. Mm. This is an actual new transform in React that has different performance implications. Interesting. So similar developer experience but different under the hood. So this this brings, I think, better tree shaking support ah. from the React import, which in the future, when they switch to, I think they'll eventually ship React as an ES module. I think all the source is written in ESM, but they're only bundling CommonJS for the actual React library, I believe. And so it's like, it's working towards that. So it'll be fun. Yeah, um, let's see. So I did the, we did this whole update, a uh, screen sharing with, uh my team at the time we did this in like a day and a half and it was i think 536 files i don't know something like thousands of lines added and, and removed you know a lot of it's in package lock but it was a bunch of ton of stuff all throughout the app and so yeah it was kind of my final hurrah good upgrade i love this kind of tooling updates i you know i learned so much about like when you have a larger app you you learn all these edge cases of the libraries and so you like fi- find these weird problems in your code base and Sometimes when it's just a library update and you don't have to worry about other features and, you know, if it's like tests that are breaking, but your app code isn't changing at all, then you can kind of like, you know, rewrite your tests without worrying about breaking the app. It's when you're like working on the app and you're changing some app functionality and then the tests start failing and you're like, uh, am I breaking everything? Because you can't trust one and just worry about the other because both are breaking. And so this kind of stuff is kind of more an isolated. You're not touching the, the mm-hmm. functionality and it's just kind of the everything else around it never let your um product team i mean biz team i mean enterprise delivery team convince you to change your core infrastructure and your application at the same time never ends well yes definitely i would definitely agree with that and all of our end-to-end tests uh we went from puppeteer three to eight i think well that's a big big jump wow yeah no tests no tests failed just some deprecation warnings and but we already like abstracted out this function that was deprecated in puppeteer so it was literally a one-line change and then bam it all just worked is super seamless like this this upgrade was actually pretty for the amount of change that had to go into it i thought was pretty straightforward that might be a little unique to my space because i had been working this app for a long time and i love reading about all these dependency changes and i think i have a pretty good understanding of a lot of the tools that we're using here so i thought it was a fun fun thing to do very nice and then i like dropped in a bunch of teams channels Here's a PR if anyone wants a reference. And uh, then I 
had my last day on Friday. So hopefully that is helpful to people. I don't know. Hi, anyone, if you're listening who works at C.H. Robinson. <laughs> Three months from now, as you're trying to debug it. Yeah, they listen to every episode of PodKit thinking, like, what if Brian left me a message? A message about how to solve this problem? That's how, that's how I get you hooked on listening to PodKit. Yeah. It's like, uh, what's the, is it steganography? Where, like, every third word in every episode is uh, contains the function that unlocks all of the, you know, no bugs, automatically upgrades to CRA5. Doesn't even exist yet upgrades it anyway <laughs> anyway uh ryan i see you have some notes here about tailwind jit you can tell us about that yeah i sure can so i haven't actually used it myself yet uh i've been um i've not been great at upgrading tailwind installations because it works perfectly fine if you just don't touch it and like we just talked about don't upgrade your infrastructure until you are committed to changing everything Right. And who's ever committed to anything ever? I definitely don't commit. That's for sure. <laughs> exactly. Don't commit and only rebase. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally going to try and sneak that in, but you, you beat me to it. That's I perfect. mean, we all know. So I put into the show notes here the, the GitHub repo thinking, oh, well, this is going to be timeless. Well, so I clicked open here this repo. And what did I see at the very top? This repository has been archived. <laughs> uh, and I can explain. That is because between writing these show notes and recording this episode and you listening to it now, Adam, the guy who makes Tailwind, and the rest of the Tailwind's team, they have rolled this into the core of Tailwind. And so now you can get it just in version 2.1, and you can turn on the little mode flag from not being defined to JIT, and it will just in time compile everything for you. So how does this thing work? Uh, I don't actually know how it works. I assume what it's doing is using some actually performant code to um, basically piggyback on top of what Purge CSS does. And so conceptually what Purge is doing is it's doing a big regex against all of the code in your code base. And then if it doesn't see that code referenced in your you know class or class name, it will... Um, remove it from your output CSS file. So it's purging what wasn't used. Now, if you look at that in a different way, what if you made the CSS file that's available to the project based on what you actually did find in the class or class name regex results? That's, I'm pretty sure what it's doing here. And so if you watch the video that Adam made, you know, he'll demo how, you know, a project with a few different custom tweaks. So maybe you add some colors and you add a couple of fonts and you add a couple of font sizes and you add a couple of different border radiuses, maybe you'll get it up to being like 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a, a Tailwind recompile. What this JIT is doing is it's just short circuiting all of that. Whatever you actually have in your class list is what it will generate and then it becomes available automatically. This does some super spooky stuff though, in my opinion. You can have these weird like MD top minus 113 picks, like really bizarre classes, class name syntax. And it will just magically, you know, apply this ad hoc one off thing. And it's cool, but it's also pretty weird. What do you guys think? Super weird. Super strange. I think if it can help with recompile times and things, I think that's a big improvement. And that's probably the real improvement and benefit of doing this. Because eventually you configure, I think I saw a tweet about this or something that was like, you know, if you add extra custom colors and some extra media queries or a few overrides, like that, like balloons your tailwinds bundle by like, you know, exponentially mm -hmm. for each one or something. And so it can really slow down if you have, you know, a large brand with a bunch of custom things and, you know, all these weird niche cases that you kind of need a JIT to be able to recompile. I think they were showing you know, in Chrome dev tools and things like if you were inspecting the element and you were using a few custom things, like it would hang your dev tools because it's shipping like 15 megabyte CSS file. And, you know, that doesn't scale very well. So doing it on the compile side, I think makes sense. What I thought was really funny is, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, I should go look at the actual source code here and, you know, see if they're doing like an ES build or a snowpack or, you know, some some kind of ultra performance go thingamajig. No, it's all just JavaScript still. So if we if we ever get tired of using this JIT and we think that uh, three to eight seconds is too long, we can can just we can just you know quickly convert this to Rust and it'll be <laughs> as fast as possible. Yeah, I, I would on top of like ES build and things, I would like to play around with that at some point because I've uh, I forget what 
I think Redux, I think Mark Arison just moved or someone worked with Mark on moving Redux and React. Oh my gosh. What's that like? React, Redu- <laughs> React Redux <laughs> and Starter Kit, all that to like, using ES Build. And it's like, you know, something like 50 times faster or something. Oh, yeah. Wild. I mean, I, I, I did some snowpack testing a few weeks ago in January. Uh, that's a few weeks ago now, by the way. <laughs> It's it's probably another order of magnitude faster, right? Uh, it is it is incredible how fast Snowpack is, and it just works. I mean, it's just like Create React app, except it's icier or something. It is. I I tried Snowpack uh, around that same time, and I was really pleasantly surprised with it. I think the next React thing I do is probably going to start with Snowpack for that reason. I've been using Parcel mostly because I just I'm done with Webpack. Friendship ended with Webpack, and I will put up with a lot of bonkers stuff if it means i don't have to deal with webpack <laughs> and i think you know parcel's great but it's also a little spooky too so i think i'm um, definitely excited to see what snowpack does where it ends up so i know when you use tailwind brandon you always use the post css integration with nest right yes oh so i never do that because i use create react app and you don't get to do that right Although I think I think post CSS is actually included in in the baseline create React app, so I could do it, but I refuse. So I always code my own. I set up a um, npm run all script. So whenever I do yarn start or yarn build, it will call the appropriate. Okay, here's the tailwind build phase, and then subsequently here's the um, you know actual JS build phase. Yeah. And so I wonder in the in the JIT paradigm. Like if I need to change that and I have to use post CSS or if I can still do my crude hacky thing, but is quite nice for my needs. I agree with that. And admittedly, the post CSS stuff, especially purge CSS, has been really brittle over time. And sometimes it just like doesn't work when you are when you're running something in watch mode. And this has happened. This isn't unique to any particular build tool or anything like that has happened with all of the ones that I've used. And so I've kind of centralized on Honestly, an approach not unlike the one you mentioned, where sometimes you just have to put it in another script, and that's that's the way it works. It's definitely the most reliable way to do it with with the least amount of spooky stuff. So I can't can't knock it. I mean, you don't have to mock it. Uh, CRA will mock it for you. That's true. Hey, so I've I've always compiled my CSS. Now, okay. Uh, the only place I've used Tailwind is on the JavaScript Minnesota website. And mm-hmm. Ryan, you were instrumental in building that. So we're doing it the Ryan way with the NPM run all scripts. We should update this website here, this JavaScript Minnesota website, to this new JIT version just to see what happens. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Uh, I support that. On my own website, also built with Eleventy, but not using Tailwind, I use PostCSS so I can use the uh, like nesting syntax. Uh, I think it's I think it's the spec that will be coming in the CSS spec at some point. But so I'm using post CSS for that, and I've like wondered if I should switch all that tooling to actually be done through like eleven T transforms. But I wonder if I'm really like missing out on some of this kind of stuff. Though I, I those transforms could probably just call post CSS directly under the hood. Like how uh, sometimes I like to kind of separate all the tooling, so each each thing is just doing its own. Mm-hmm. So you can do it in parallel. But if Tailwind needs to have a JIT that needs to watch all the HTML files, but those HTML files aren't generated until after the build, you know, then it starts to like you have this waterfall of compilation that needs to happen. Why are the HTML files not available until the build? Oh, I get it. Because they're Nunjux files until they're compiled. Ew. Well, no, that's okay. It doesn't watch the HTML. It watches um, source files. Yeah. As long as your strings appear somewhere in your source folder, you're good to go. Yeah. I was worried there. You had me worried there. And Yeah. I, I uh, should look more into this. This would be interesting. When... When I switch to Tailwind eventually, right? I've been saying that for a while. You know, I I, I find Tailwind to be wonderful, but um, it's not for everybody and it's not for every purpose. Like if you have a simple site you just want to make and you just need a few styles, there's totally better things. I will say it's been fun working on the styles for my own website because it's kind of a challenge of how small can I make this bundle by writing it all by hand. So I've done some kind of uh, weird dynamic import code for my fun mode. So... I have as little as possible running. I think it's just inlined in in a script element on every single page in the site, you know, through a template or something, but 
just so I can have a couple, I think it's like an on click, on hover, and on touch start on this button. And then it does a dynamic import, unpolyfilled or anything, just straight up um, to fetch all the, you know, it's it's one file, but like there's a ton of inline CSS in that file as well, because I just want to do one network request. So it's like having all this hard control over it is kind of nice as well, because I can kind of optimize these things. Whereas if I'm just using standard bundlers, it's going to, you know, like, okay, well, this module has CSS and JavaScript. We're going to make it be multiple files and you import the JavaScript. And then once that's loaded, then it makes the request to fetch the CSS. And then you have a stagger render. And it's just like, I just want to inline it all for just this one, you know, let me configure it file by file and I can optimize exactly how I want to. And some of these tools are, I think they're good, but my personal website is almost feels too small to really need some of this kind of stuff. And that's probably true. It's just a personal site. And so it's fun to read about though. Know what, what you can do, what's out there. Well, should we talk about new Twitter followees? You bet. Or shout outs or whatever we want to call this section. Shout outs? Should we, should we rename it? Sure. I've been saying new Twitter follows. I don't know if anyone's been catching that for the last like many episodes and in all the show notes. I've been saying follows instead of followees. That's uh, too confusing. Fo- following is in October. <laughs> Good pun. That is a very good pun. <laughs> I don't Thanks. know if it's a good pun or not. It might not be, but it was it was a pun that I made. Well, it's it's so neat. Like we are the target audience <laughs> of that pun, and only it's true. Only listeners of this show would understand that pun. This is true. Yeah. So as as usual, um, I'm not really following anybody in tech uh, right now. Uh, that might change soon because I just started a new contract, and um, I'm working on a team that is very full of really 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 smart people and they're really kind of plugged into the ecosystem and the community which is uh cool and kind of kind of an adjustment because i think like when i say the community like i you know i i think um all of us here are pretty close in the minnesota tech community um but a lot of these folks are very back in the a mode that's similar to other places i've worked where they're like plugged into the tech community at large and really following a lot of you know, the everyday happenings of, of what's going on in um, React and web performance communities and other sorts of communities. And that's really cool. That's just not, uh, that's that's the thing that I've intentionally kind of stepped back from a little bit because uh, as you might have heard, as you might have intuited when you hear me talk about Create React app and stuff, sometimes it's, it can be really frustrating, a frustrating thing to follow. So I don't know, there might be, there might be new followers in the future is what I'm saying, but right until then, uh, you get more music and this music isn't even necessarily sad music. This is, uh, I just have one for you right now. And I think the one I put here, I could be wrong. Yeah. A song by, uh, FKJ, which stands for French Kiwi juice and Tom Mish. Uh, it's a really like kind of jazzy groovy sort of deal. I've been really um, digging uh, Tom Mish's stuff recently. He has another collaboration with uh, Yusuf Days, uh, a, a, a drummer in the UK. Um, all really good groovy tunes. And rather than follow people on Twitter, I've just been listening to this song on loop. So, you know, that is my new Twitter followee. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good track. Give it a listen. It's fun. It'll, it'll grow on you. Well, thanks. Um... What did you listen to this month, Brian? <laughs> I can actually let you know that if you want, but um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I think it's on the homepage of Brian's website, right? Yeah, go to my website. That's okay. just the last month. Um, I've listened to a ton of Ash Nico this year. Good, good stuff. Let's see. I followed several people. I've kind of given up on my like follow 500 people and no more, but um, I, I don't know, 530 or something now. But anyway, uh, I followed several people. Um, I think I'll be working on who I follow the last couple of months for several episodes of PodKit. But first up here is Stephanie Eccles. She's a software engineer at Microsoft, but does a ton of tweeting and blogging and writing about CSS and styling. And it's some really good content. Um, I think she's written a few 11T plugins. I think I've used some of them. Blog posts around that too. I thought she was a developer advocate, but maybe she's just like the most uh, education-focused engineer out there. I don't know. Really good stuff. Accessibility, CSS, HTML, LMT, design systems, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've learned a lot from her. Uh, let's see. Next up is Sarah uh, Nikita. Uh, FTW is her uh, Twitter name. Um, I've heard her on several podcasts over the last few years. She's a uh, React JavaScript engineer based out of Germany. Some really good content there. Um, I'll just quick shout out. Uh, so Sarah's been featured on the Single Threaded podcast, which I have linked in the show notes, that 
Jen Creighton puts on, which is like excellent podcast. If you're looking for a like front end kind of or engineering or tech podcast, I cannot recommend this podcast enough. Jen does such a good job organizing it um, and some really, really great conversations on there. Sarah was featured on there in March 17th episode. And finally here we have Dominic who goes by at TK Dodo, D-O-D-O. He is a contributor to React Query and is this, uh, I think right now it's a five-part blog series on using React Query and there's some really good stuff in there. So I thought I'd give him a follow. He's uh, contributed some awesome, awesome stuff to the whole React Query ecosystem, which if you if you didn't know, I'm a big fan of React Query and I think all of us are here. So that's who I followed or some of who I followed. What about you, Ryan? I followed one whole person. Uh, so as you may know, I have purchased many books and I've read approximately 25 pages of all of them (laughs) and I continue to do that. And as a part of that ongoing endeavor, uh, staff Eng was a book that I recently purchased and this guy who didn't write the book, but who's in the same like team of writers about that book, I guess he made a podcast that fits the same kind of staff engineering stuff and so this is um david and uh yeah we i I tweeted at him to uh just put the link to the podcast in in his tweet thread and he followed me back so that's pretty cool Ooh, nice uh and and you know it's always good to sort of read uh and and listen to what people at this staff engineering level have to say yeah totally i think those levels are always very kind of confusing to me as a person who comes from often a very like flat organization where there aren't like staff is not like i've never worked at a place where like a staff engineer was like a thing i think the higher level the the more levels you get to the flatter it gets yeah it's like one of those four dimensional things yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's bigger on the inside right as it were it's flatter yeah. on the inside actually flatter on the inside okay got it no i'm excited uh be definitely interested in checking that out that was my one and only Twitter followee. Well, uh, let's see. What do you, what do we have coming up next time? Uh, work, 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 more work. work. Probably some more work after that. Um, sunsetting some projects, starting some new stuff, getting further ramped up on the new stuff I've already started. I don't know. Um, I guess around May probably going to be moving, which is probably going to entail moving a bunch of stuff up a block. Mm-hmm. Or down a block. I can advocate for the one block move. It was a pretty good move last summer. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing is like if if I'm gonna move like if if I'm gonna move more than like to the building next door or the building next door on the other side, I may as well be moving across town because I'm gonna have to like, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like carry stuff six blocks. I'm gonna have to drive it. Yeah. Whereas if I find a place that's literally immediately next door, that's pretty pretty sweet. But all the places next door are really kind of a whole deal. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But yeah, that's that's and it'll be more summery then. That'll be cool. I don't know. I'm gonna go for some walks. But it probably won't be cool based on what we experienced last week. That's true. It'll probably be really warm. But it'll be it will be interesting. It'll be very interesting. Yeah. It hit over eighty here in the Twin Cities on Monday and um that it was too hot. I don't like it. Yeah, I mean, even even Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, it was pretty. It was pretty unbearable. I mean, like I went for a nice long walk in Theo Worth on um, on Saturday, and it was like, it was awesome. But it was like, cheapers. The sun was a whole deal. No more, please. That's enough heat. Lots of water. Bring drink water, kiddos. Uh, how about you, Ryan? Yeah, um, you know, working like usual. Um... I think there's uh, a lot of um, exciting activities going on around these days, some kind of like uh, mass vaccination thing, trying to get one of those these days, trying not to melt once it gets hot again. And for me, I'm starting a new job on Monday, so that'll be uh, probably a huge focus of my next few weeks. Uh, Hope that goes well. If you have any like tips on starting a new job and stuff, please uh, send me a tweet. I'd love to hear what you have to think about it. My number one tip for going for your first day at work is to actually go to your first day at work. <laughs> a lot of people don't know they're supposed to go on their first day of work and they don't show up. And then it's like, Hmm, wait a second. 
I, I have an 8.30 meeting scheduled on my personal email where I will meet the team and get my like account with the actual company set up and things. There you go. Uh, which was nice to hear. They don't want to like send me credentials over email or anything because that's not secure. So. so that way they can read to you your credentials <laughs> and then have them intercepted by Skype. I mean Teams. I mean something. Yeah, I don't know. That's probably more difficult to intercept, but... Yeah, so a new job. Um, JavaScript Minnesota will be meeting at the end of the month. Uh, we've had a good good series here the last few meetups where we've just kind of had a, a chill show and tell, do some breakout rooms where we just kind of meet with people in you know, groups of like seven to seven to ten, just kind of introducing ourselves, chatting a little bit, and then we come back to the main group and people are demoing things for five, ten minutes. And it's been r- really nice. It's like all the, all the good things about a meetup without <laughs> any of the negatives. So, you know, it's you can you can find full-length conference talks and things online and that's pretty asynchronous to watch and so what what can a meetup bring and that's like that community and showing on what we've been working on and i think that's we've kind of found a good sweet spot here with jsmn so i definitely look forward to those yeah uh i got my first pfizer vaccine dose last weekend so i have another one coming up later in april so definitely excited for that oh nice um yeah where can we find you all uh, you can find me just about anywhere, but mostly on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN, which is also my name on Instagram, which is where I post pictures of bread. Aside from that, you can find me in beautiful, historic, northeast Minneapolis, Minnesota. Classic. But don't approach me. I scare easily. Um, that's about it. How about you, Brian? Ooh, mixing it up here. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. Yeah, I think actually since our last podcast, I did a little bit of a redesign on the homepage. So there's a few more gradients now. And I think I removed affiliate links and it took a new profile photo. So, Oh, yes. That that picture was amazing. Uh, there, there are tweets. So I, <laughs> I set up a little photo studio in my living room yesterday uh, using HomeKit lights. I realized I have like a HomeKit light that can change to any color. So I took off the lampshade so it would be a little more direct. And then I used another dimmable light that i just put a piece of paper in front to diffuse that was a white light and then use my ring light connected like a usb battery and blasted myself with some blue light and kneeled on a pillow and used my apple watch as a remote viewfinder for my phone and it you know some sore knees from kneeling on the ground a bunch and figuring it all out but i think it yeah it turned out pretty well i'm pretty happy with it so yeah i would i would say so it also the the way that the the background in your image works it looks like the middle of your footer (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely along that uh along that line yeah that would be kind of fun to to tinker with uh where can we find you ryan well you can find me just about everywhere but especially on twitter at ryan amar and of course on my website uh where's that again ryanmarepersed.com uh where i haven't updated anything in quite some time i really need to get around to doing that but i would also like to mention that you can also find this incredible thing it's called devastatedwasteland.com. I don't want to tell you any more about it. I just want you to go there and enjoy what it's about. It is really good. It's really, really good. It's good. Yes. There will be a link in the show notes for all of those who just want to click or tap a link. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk65. Um, if you want to discuss the episode, swing on over to our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. Uh, which is like largely inactive, but we are there. Or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash uh, the next TV. Uh, and if you like what we're doing here at the network, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash the next TV. And yeah, I think that's our episode number 65. Wonderful. Have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.